we're waiting for the salmon to come up the river. And the salmon don't come. It sometimes happens. That's your food supply for the next four or five months. What do you do? Your only option is to go to the bigger village. You could try and attack them, but you're a small village. They're a big village. They partly became a big village by bringing people in so that they would have, they would be too big for other groups to attack. So how do you get into that? Well, you can offer something. You're going to give them prestige. You're going to put yourself indebted to them. You're going to lose some of your autonomy to them. I'll show you how with the Northwest Coast. So this is when I think we'll also see warfare uh, entering, the, entering the adaptive mix as a serious piece of of hunter-gatherers adapt adaptation. And this is, this, is a, this is sort of, it's a very controversial topic at the, at the moment. But here I'm just looking at uh, population pressure. This is high population pressure and this is low population pressure. Okay? Huh? I measured population pressure by looking at population density relative to the productivity of an environment. And it, it, I had to take the environments and decide what portion is forest, what portion is savanna, and then calculate the, uh, how much of the productivity was, uh, is available to people using some, just some ratios of values out there. It gets a little detailed, but I can tell you afterwards. But it's the measure, basically, of number of people relative to the amount of food available in that landscape. It's not simply population density. That's from the people. That's right. Yeah. 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 It's in the new edition of the book, yeah. Um, and what this, these are the these are data here that I got from the standard cross-cultural sample that we were looking at from the book. Yeah. Um, that uh, are graphing. This is it's an odd variable, uh, but this is this is the high levels of violence to low levels of violence. So what we see here, if we ignore these kind of exceptions here, there's a relationship between population pressure and uh, uh, war warfare, such that you get more violence where you have high population pressure, less violence where there's low population. This graph works a little, not the way I'd like it to work, but I, now, now, now I wish I had altered this variable here, but I didn't, because I didn't want to change the way it was originally reported. Okay. Uh, this group here, Comanche, if you, if you know anything about Native North American uh, ethnography and Native North American history, you, will, you would know um, that the Comanche were regarded as some of the most vicious of all Native American groups. They were right up there with the, with the uh, Iroquois, just, just vicious uh, fighters. So you would, why aren't they up here? Some of, most of that vicious fighting was not directed at other Aboriginal peoples. It was directed at white people. So this variable is only looking at how much they're fighting their Aboriginal neighbors, not outside societies. Uh, the Yurok, this is a California group. And I suspect what happens with California groups is they start doing so much fighting that eventually they find some way to fight without fighting. They do it through ritual behaviors. We'll see this on the Northwest Coast. Because the level of warfare gets so high, gets so extreme, that uh, people opt to find some other way 
to compete with one another, but not to absorb them. Maybe, I'm not sure. But still, the general pattern is that warfare correlates with population pressure, which is exactly what I'd expect to have. And we see a similar pattern, although not quite very clear, with uh, just plain homicide rates. These are high homicide rates, high population pressure. There is a, a weakly significant relationship here if we take the Kiwi out of the picture. We are a tropical group, and for years I've felt that the ethnographic data on them is not entirely accurate. Uh, they just they live in a very sad, difficult situation, uh, and I suspect that the rate of violence is higher than it really should should be. Although I can't give you a really good reason why we should throw them out of the but the general pattern is still with high rates of homicide with high rates of population. But there appears to be a maximum. This is a log scale here. And there appears to be a maximum of homicide rate that, that hunter-gatherer societies plateau. So the data are not very good there, but they still suggest that Warfare violence increases with population pressure, which would not be a surprise to, that, to be to be true. Well, now let's go back and look at group size. This is a model that Eric Smith devised and and tested uh, among the uh, the Eskimo people that he worked with. Uh, he was asking, how big should a group be? And he figured that there are lots of activities where it's good to have more people involved in the activity. If you want to hunt bison, for example, uh, buffalo, they're very hard to hunt on your own. Very hard to hunt by yourself. If you really want to hunt buffalo, you should do it communally. You need some larger group of to hunt those animals. Same is true with uh, bighorn sheep. Hard to hunt individually, better to hunt in a, a group. If you hunt in a group, you'll acquire more food than if you hunt individually. And you'll actually have a higher return rate if you hunt in a group. But we can imagine, easily imagine, that there's going to be some maximum to that group size. 50 people? Yes, we can hunt. We can hunt bison with 50 people. 1,000 people? We probably won't get any more bison, but we will have to divide that bison up among all 1,000 people participating. So this is what I call the many hands make light work phase. And after that, after you've reached your maximum group size, where you've maximized your per capita return rate, any additional people are just going to lower that per capita return rate. This is the too many cooks spoils the broth phase. I'm sorry, these are American sayings, but maybe they translate into English. You have something similar. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, we can imagine that at some part you want to have people, and then you don't want them. Well, what happens in our case where there's a small village, sedentary village, it's run on hard times, the salmon didn't come, so they're going to go to a bigger village and ask them for a share of, of their food because that big village is sitting on a good salmon river which has had a good, a good run. They've got food. Probably not lots of food. What could happen? Their group is probably at its maximum size. So if they start giving food to this, this people from a smaller group coming up, uh, they, they might be, that small group is going to be in their debt, right? 
But if I'm sitting on the best salmon stream, do I need you? Do I need a favor from you? No, I'm not going to need it. You're on the small stream. When things are bad in my river, they're probably terrible in your river. When I need you, you won't be able to help me. This is the opposite from the nomadic situation we saw before, where one group allows another group in because at some point in the future, the host group will need that visitor's group uh, resources, will need access to their, to their land. That doesn't happen in a sedentary case where some villages are sitting on the good locations and they don't need the people from the poor locations. At the same time, they run the risk of warfare from the smaller vill villages. So this is sort of like tolerated theft. They're going to buy off the smaller group. They're going to give them enough resources so that that group won't attack them. That the cost of warfare will be too high. So you want to give them just enough, just enough food. So what can you do in these situations? For people who are coming and petitioning you after your group is already at its maximum size, you can say, okay, you can have a share, but you don't get an, an equal share. You're going to get less. So that everyone in your village is going to have to take a cut, but they'll still be doing better than the people who are petitioning. In the meantime, the people who are petitioning for, for food are maybe getting enough for them to survive so they're, they're, it's not worth attacking this, this other, other village. How does this get justified? How does this, the, the group sitting on a good food source, justify not giving an equal share to the other group? This becomes classic Marxist ideologies, where you say the reason we're doing well and you're doing poorly is because, well, frankly, we're better than you. We're more important. We're more closely related to the gods. You're poor people. You deserve what you get. I'm going to give you a little bit of food because I'm a generous person. Even though I'm sitting on a mountain of salmon, I'll give you just enough to keep you alive. And so you won't have any incentive to attack this, this village. But I'm doing that because I'm a generous person. And that's how they always express it as. I'm a generous person. I'll give you some food. Aren't I a nice guy? Right? I'm a wonderful chief. Um, and so uh, this is what happens in these situations where some villages are acquiring more resources than other uh, villages. This is this curve here. Really, people have found sort of describes the relationship between uh, a, a resource. It could be food or it could be money, and the amount of utility that it has to people. And what they find is that the same amount of a resource, we'll call it X here, has different utilities to poor people, middle class people, and wealthy people. And it's a, it's a bit odd. We can all understand that someone like Bill Gates can afford to give away lots of money, right? Because he's got so much of it. It's, the, you know, uh, $100,000, yeah, sure, here. I've got it right in my pocket, right? He can give this money away because he's got so much of it. That amount of money means nothing to him. Small amounts of money also mean nothing to poor people. Studies show they actually give more to charity than the middle class people here. 
they give a greater greater fraction of their income than middle class people, because middle class people can invest that money. It has greater utility for them. A poor person has no intention to go to college. Why save for college? They'll give the money away. A middle class person intends to send their kids to college. That money has utility. Can't give it away. I need it because it's going to move their kids up. Once you're up here, that same amount of money doesn't have much utility because you've got so much of the, the resources. It's sort of like tolerated debt, and it's also costly signal. Someone at the very top can signal how powerful they are by giving away lots of resources that actually don't mean much to them, but mean a lot to the people below them. So if Bill Gates can give $100,000 to you, it'll make a big difference to you. Uh, it's less than euros. Uh, but it means nothing to him. Bill Gates buys lots of prestige with it, but it really costs him relatively little. Same thing happens among chiefs in these big sedentary communities. This is a long argument. Uh, so what we see happening is inequality between villages and inequality between general classes of, of people. At the same time, we see inequality between men and women. For a couple of reasons. One is that women become important as a source of, of labor. And men use that labor to their political uh, uh, advantage, mostly by putting up more stored food that they can then use to, to put other people in debt to them. Women also become manipulated through marriages to build alliances between men who have, who have acquired high prestige. This is no different, absolutely no different than the marriages that occurred between the wealthy houses in India. The, the daughter of, of, of a German duke marrying the, the son of a British duke. They were doing this to build alliances. Um, they often never met until the wedding day. No one cared. It didn't matter. You had no say in it. Neither of the people had any say in it because it's, it's about relationships between royal houses alliances between wealthy, powerful people. So women start to become manipulated through um, marriages as a way to build alliances between, between men. The men also start to lose autonomy to the wealthy fathers or brothers of their, of their, their wife. And I pointed out before that children in these communities tend to become more peer-reared, which has an effect on the culture that they then grow up in. Kids who are peer-reared, who are raised in these age groups, all the five-year-old kids running around together, all the 10-year-old kids running around together, they tend to become more competitive, to grow up to be competitive, to uh, rely on manipulating others to get what they want, uh, and to be more, their view of the world is more gender segregated. This is exactly the, psycholo the psychology you want if you're going to participate in these sorts of things. So I'll just briefly talk about the the best ethnographic case we have here, uh, the northwest coast of North, North America, uh, where we had a number of uh, lots of hunter-gatherer groups, all of which are basically sedentary, living right along the coast, most of them trying to position themselves on the mouth of a uh, salmon stream. And a lot of what I'm saying is concerns the Quakutal whose name isn't actually Kwakula, whose name is actually Kwakwakula. Cool name. Uh, 
northwest coast of North America, very interesting environment. It's a wet temperate forest. Uh, the forest can be ex extremely dense. This is actually not a very good picture. It, 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 uh, it, can, it, it can be literally impossible to move through this forest. There's so much uh, underbrush and dead trees and vegetation down there. It's, it's extremely difficult to move through it. And it's mountainous. It, it's flat right here at the coast, and then boom, it's the Canadian Rockies, right? So the cost of being nomadic in this environment is very high between the forest and the mountains. It's a, it's a difficult place to move through. Uh, it's also a very difficult place to find places where you can actually live. It, it's a very stormy, rocky coast, or it's very steep. There are relatively few places where you can actually uh, inhabit. The folks who lived right along the coast were heavily dependent on marine foods, uh, but especially salmon, especially runs of, of salmon in the, in the fall. That was their primary uh, winter food. They lived in large sedentary villages, very small territories, very small ter territories with very well-defined boundaries to food. Everyone knew where those, those boundaries were. Uh, as I said, they depended on stored fish for the winter foods. They did a lot of sea mammal hunting, which was dangerous with the high technology costs that we've talked about. And they have very strict ownership rules about who owned which, which resources. And in some places, these got extreme. Uh, for the quack Udal, the the, the owner of a whale, it depended on who owned, and it was the chiefs, it was always the chiefs who owned stretches of beach. Whatever washed up on that beach belonged to him. He had first claim. Not the person who owned it, not the person who found it. That would be true for nomadic hunter-gatherers. In this case, it's whose ever beach it, it washes up. So if people had to be careful when they killed the whales, they, they Normally, you would kill it and let it wash up on the beach. You had to kind of drag it to the right place so it would wash up on the right beach, not on someone else's right beach. If we went down into California, among some of the California groups, families owned specific acorn trees, the, the, the oak trees. They owned specific ones. And sometimes families owned particular sides of the tree. So all the acorns that fall on the north side are mine, and all those that fall on the south side are yours. Uh, but those uh, fishing localities on the northwest coast are limited to really a very few places. Because you just don't want to live on a stream. You want to live on a big stream. And you don't want to just live on a big stream. You want to live and control the access to the place where you can take salmon out in large numbers. And that means you generally want a place where the stream gets narrow. And you want it where it gets narrow so that you can build your fish, fishing weir and your fishing platform over that stretch of the, of the river. So you're literally going to control the physical access to the place on the river where you can remove salmon at in the greatest amount during the salmon run. So you don't control the river, you just control a particular place on the, the, the river. Lots of people have said, oh, the Northwest Coast, this is where there's food abundance. And that's why you have sedentary hunter-gatherers with all their elaborate material culture and, and ritual culture. This is this is true in one way, but not true in another. There's an, a, a lot of food there in terms of fish, but you have a relatively short window to get it out. 
Because once the run is passed, it's passed. It's not, it's not coming again. Some rivers had several runs, but there was usually just one or two really big ones. Lots of food there, but you've got to get it out in really, and sometimes in just a few days. You've got a few days to get four, five, six months of food out of the, the, the river. That's a huge bottleneck of, of time. And you've got to get, you have to work at a, an enormous rate of return to get four or five months of food out in just a few, a few days. Uh, so there's an abundance of food there, but there's a catch. You have a very short period of time to get it, and you can only get it at certain places on certain rivers. So there's both a, a temporal, small temporal window, and there's a small geographic window to get to that, that, that food. So we see hierarchical leadership on the Northwest Coast as individuals compete for controlling these, these, these places. Villages compete with villages, and within villages, families compete with families. And it's not just nuclear families. They actually form these larger, among the quaqueudal, they were called numaeums. These are patrilineal descent groups. But elsewhere on the coast, further north, you get these large matrilineal moieties. Oh, plain moieties. Uh, that gets difficult. But basically, the village is divided into two groups. And that's what, yeah, there's moiety. It comes from the French, moiety, that half. So half the village belongs to one, and half the village belongs to one. So let me People formed alliances. Smaller villages formed alliances with bigger villages by marrying uh, people up to uh, higher higher statuses. It was often a lower status man would hire a woman from a higher status family. These these marriages were uh, usually arranged. They were negotiated. They were paid for in gifts. This is a man arriving in a quaqueudal wedding party from another village. Before he gets to his wife for the ceremony, he is going to run through a gauntlet of warriors who are going to beat him soundly as he's running through there. This is the symbolic way of telling him, don't forget your place. We're letting you marry this woman, but you are of lower status. And for the rest of his life, if he wants to keep that, that marriage, he is going to owe labor to the, that wealthy family that allowed him to marry one of their daughters. And they're going to tell that daughter, this is your marriage. You're not getting out of it because that wealthy family wants that man's labor. This is a loss of autonomy. That man has lost autonomy, and his wife has lost autonomy. This is a non-egalitarian society, and it forms under these sorts of, of conditions. Sedentism, high population density, where people no longer have movement as an option to when things go bad. And things invariably go bad. The Northwest Coast is also uh, very famous for its elaborate uh, art and its elaborate uh, ritual culture. These often took place during the potlatches, which you probably heard about. These big uh, elaborate feasts. They're competitive feasts. These are feasts that a chief holds, and he sort of expects the other chief to return this, this feast at some point in the future. And his goal is to make it impossible for him to return, to hold such a big feast such a huge feast that you can never return. The word potlatch comes from a, it's Chinook, which is a, a trade language. Uh, I forget the exact word, but it's, its literal translation is to flatten. To 
flat. And that's the objective. I invite you over to my village, and I have such a huge feast that I have flattened you. There's no way you from a small village can possibly return this huge feast that I just put on. Lots of food, lots of, of, of dances, lots of destruction of material goods. Uh, this is they, this is uh, this guy is a Hamatsa dancer, a cannibal uh, dancer. These are some blankets that are piled up to give away. These are some other uh, dancers. They're portraying these uh, uh, these huge birds with these huge, huge beaks. So, some of them are so big, the masks are so big, that someone had to walk behind the dancer and hold him back by the shoulders because the, the, the mask was pulling him over. It's, it's so big. This represents a bird that flies down out of the sky. And, Eats, eats people. This stuff, Northwest Coast, everything deals with uh, eating and being eaten. And the, the cannibal dancer here is somebody who can't control his hunger anymore. As part of his dance, he jumps into the crowd and bites people and rips out flesh. And uh, It's a long ritual. He actually has to be taken out into the woods and he goes through this whole ritual uh, period where he has to be reintroduced to humanity. You have to make him human again. It's part of this whole long ritual. It takes, took months to do. Uh, people would give, the chief would give stuff away, or sometimes he would just destroy it. Take it out into the ocean and dump all the blankets into the ocean. Sometimes pull slaves out and kill them. There were this was the big thing. This was the major thing. These coppers. These are, uh, they look like shields, and they're, they're metal. They're made out of native copper, and often embossed, and then sometimes painted. Th these were the most important things. Uh, but they would sometimes give them away, but often just destroy them, break them, throw them into the ocean. This is costly signal. This is a way of somebody saying, I can destroy all this stuff, and it does this village no harm. And it's a way of saying, don't even think about attacking us. This is how powerful we are. Don't even think about fighting us. Uh, and it's a way for a chief to say, this is how many people stand behind me. This is how much power I command. Because all these people have given me, me, all of this stuff. I can give it to you, or I can throw it away. It makes no difference to me. I'm still powerful. This is costly signal. Sorry to interrupt you. We have to exit the building. It's 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. We have 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, and the purpose of many of these feasts was to publicly recognize the chief's rights and, and privileges. It, it reaffirms why he's the chief. That's what uh, totem poles are all about and why they get uh, erected. All of this is a story of a chief's lineage and the important thing that his family has done over the years and that's why he's the chief because of all of this, this story that's, that's here. So it's a way to reaffirm his position of, of power and authority over the people in his own village, but also over the village that he's invited in for this for this feast. So this is the um, the, the context uh, in which non-egalitarian uh, communities form. I suppose you might, from this, you might guess that uh, uh, this is, uh, the the transition from a nomadic to a sedentary existence was uh, maybe the worst thing that ever happened to the human race. Uh, so this is what I'd like to close on, that um, you can study anything from hunter-gatherers, uh, egalitarian communities, how they function, to non-egalitarian communities. Uh, in a way, I think I've learned everything I need to know
about people by studying uh, hunter hunter gatherers. They're uh, uh, an entry into everything you want to know about uh, humanity. And since much of Finland's early archaeology is hunter gatherers, that makes its archaeology very important to study. Even late is hunter gatherers. I'm sorry I kept you so long. No, but I mean, not that about this later. The late uh, archaeology, I mean, is not something. Even when we have a when you have farming, you still are hunting at all. Yes. My dad. My dad. That's gone.